Welcome to this module on understanding substance use. In this module, you'll learn about the spectrum of substance use, the nature of problematic substance use and substance use disorder. You'll learn about the connections between brain development, adverse childhood experiences, and substance use, and you'll gain an understanding of how resilience is built and harm is reduced. You'll also learn ways in which educators like you can support youth. Use this module alongside your educator's guide, which provides additional information, tools, and resources to support your learning. Let's begin. Alcohol is the most commonly used substance among youth in Canada. In 2019, almost half of young people in grades 7 to 12 said they used alcohol, while 18% said they used cannabis, making it the second most commonly used substance among youth. Youth tend to use substances such as alcohol and cannabis for a variety of reasons and to varying degrees. Some do so out of curiosity, to feel good, or because of peer pressure. Others do it to relieve stress, anxiety, or pain, to enhance academic or physical performance, or even to rebel against their parents. For many, their use is experimental and low risk. For others, it may lead to addiction. To be less stigmatizing, we now call addiction problematic substance use or substance use disorder. Substance use varies from person to person. It can range from no use, beneficial use or casual use, to problematic use to a substance use disorder. This is known as the spectrum of use. People may use one substance alone or more than one substance at the same time. This is known as polysubstance use. The way they use these substances can also vary along the spectrum. For example, a person may engage in problematic use of alcohol and casual cannabis use. Let's look more closely at problematic substance use and substance use disorder. Not everyone who uses substances will develop a substance use disorder, but anyone can experience problems with substance use, whatever their age. And people can develop a substance use disorder with any psychoactive substance. This includes substances that are socially accepted and widely available, such as alcohol and cannabis, those prescribed by a physician, such as medications to manage pain or ADHD, and illegal substances like heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine. The risk of developing problematic substance use or a substance use disorder varies from person to person and can be influenced by a number of complex factors. These factors include a person's genetic profile, family history of substance use disorder, social or economic influences such as poverty, isolation, discrimination, and racism, and trauma such as violence or chronic stress, especially at an early age. It is important to note that just because someone has risk factors, this does not mean they will develop a substance use disorder. These factors can simply increase their risk. Most people don't choose to use substances to the point where it is harmful to their health and well-being. Common misconceptions are that people who develop a substance use disorder don't have the willpower or motivation to stop using and that substance use is their choice. This just isn't true. Research shows that the brain is designed to adapt and respond to its environment and the conditions it is exposed to. Regular substance use can lead to changes in the brain causing some people to develop problematic substance use or a substance use disorder. Let's take a look at how substance use affects the brain. The part of the brain located behind the forehead is called the prefrontal cortex. One of its functions is to regulate the fear and reward pathways in our brains. The reward system is triggered by things like food, sex, and social connection, things that affect our survival. When we engage in these activities, a chemical called dopamine is released into the brain. Dopamine influences our mood and makes us feel pleasure. Alcohol and other drugs also stimulate this reward system, flooding the brain with dopamine. When something makes us feel good, we want to do it again. But over time, the brain responds by building up a tolerance to the substance. When this happens, more and more of the substance is needed to produce the same feelings of reward. 
When a person has problematic substance use or a substance use disorder, the brain's reward circuits or neural pathways are changed so that the brain makes getting this extreme reward experience a priority over pursuing any other needs. This process can cause the decision-making and impulse control functions of the prefrontal cortex to become impaired. This makes it difficult to stop using substances even when a person wants to. To understand problematic substance use and substance use disorder, it may be helpful to think of the four C's. Compulsion, cravings, consequences, and control. Compulsion refers to compulsive or repeating behaviors in order to seek out the substance in spite of negative or harmful effects. Cravings refers to physical cravings for a substance that feel the same as the need for water or food. Consequences refers to the continued use of a substance in spite of negative consequences. And control refers to the inability to control use. In other words, trying to stop and not being able to. When all four C's are present, a person is thought to be using substances problematically and would likely meet the criteria for a substance use disorder. Critical brain development occurs during adolescence, making youth particularly vulnerable to the short and long-term effects of alcohol and other substances. Substance use in youth has been linked to changes in brain structure, function, and cognition. These changes can have immediate and long-term negative impacts on factors such as academic performance and social functioning. These impacts can extend into adulthood. The experiences we have early in life affect how our brains develop. Being exposed to positive interactions builds resilience and a foundation for healthy brain development. This leads to improved learning, behavior, health and social well-being throughout life. Stress is another major factor that shapes how our brains develop. Events that create positive stress, like the first day of school or meeting new people, can be healthy when supportive adults prepare a child for future challenges. In contrast, traumatic events like having an accident or losing a loved one create negative stress. Negative stress can have a lasting impact on the developing brain of a child, but a supportive adult can help to buffer the stress response. Exposure to stressful and traumatic experiences over a long period of time, also known as toxic stress, can disrupt healthy brain development. This happens when a child has no supportive adults to buffer the response to trauma. Examples of trauma and toxic stress include neglect, abuse, parental substance use, bullying, or violence. When they occur before the age of 18, these events are called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Young children who experience ACEs are at a greater risk for developing health problems later in life, including problematic substance use or substance use disorder. Having a mental health condition in childhood or adolescence can also increase the risk of problematic substance use or having a substance use disorder in adulthood. Research suggests that youth with substance use disorders also have high rates of co-occurring mental health conditions. Youth may use substances to manage a mental health condition or to cope with pain caused by trauma and ACEs. Resilience is the ability to cope with life's challenges in a healthy way. Resilient skills such as regulating emotions, managing stress, and problem solving can be developed through supportive relationships with trusted adults. One of the simplest ways to build resilience is through positive and caring interactions with adults and caregivers. Educators can play an important role in helping young people to build resilience as mentors, confidants, and trusted sources of information. Just as there are many pathways to substance use, there are also many pathways to getting well. Some people find abstinence-based programs effective. Others seek substance use services that reduce harm and help them gradually taper off their use. For example, medication-assisted treatment for alcohol or opioid use. Despite the challenges of problematic substance use and substance use disorder and their link to past trauma, many people manage to live well with these health conditions.
There are several ways in which educators can support youth to learn about substance use and its relationship to trauma. They can create a safe space and opportunities for open, non-judgmental conversations about the spectrum of substance use. This can reduce stigma, fear, and shame while allowing youth to see educators as allies. They can discuss the relationship between mental health, ACEs, and substance use. And they can work with students to identify healthy coping skills and to build resilience against stress. Now, let's recap the main takeaways from this module. Substance use varies from person to person and occurs along a spectrum. Some may use substances and never experience problematic substance use or substance use disorder. Substance use disorder is not a choice, but a complex medical condition that can affect the structure and function of the brain. A number of factors can increase the risk of developing problematic substance use or a substance use disorder. These include genetic profile, family history of substance use disorder, social or economic influences, and experiences of trauma. Just because someone has risk factors doesn't mean they will develop problematic substance use or a substance use disorder. People who experience ACEs are more likely to have poor outcomes in learning, relationships, and physical and mental health, including substance use. ACEs can be prevented and their impact mitigated. Treatment is possible and living well with problematic substance use or a substance use disorder is attainable and sustainable. We've reached the end of this module. To further support your learning on this topic, refer to the Educator's Guide for additional information and resources.